Okay, so continuing on um, in lecture six, um, we've talked about how to relate Ka and pKa to each other and now to the change in Gibbs free energy of the system. Um, now we're gonna sort of go in a more qualitative direction and talk about trends and how we might predict the relative acidity of uh, different acids. So, And so the important thing um, that's worth that's worth mentioning here is that there's not sort of one universal factor that we can look at um, to rank uh, acidity. It's you know these kind of these trends are sort of limited in their um, you know in the sort of number of systems they can apply to, and so we're going to restrict our discussion to comparing acidity across rows and then comparing acidity down columns, okay? And the rows are perhaps a little more straightforward to think about um, as you move from left to right in the periodic table um, across a single row, the electronegativity of the atoms increase and so the acidity of the conjugate acid or the, you know, the, the acidic form of those atoms uh, tends to increase. So <clears throat> okay. Um, and so, for example, if we consider the second row, let me go to a new, new slide here. Um, Okay, if we consider removing the hydrogens that I've underlined here in red, okay, uh, dumping the electrons on those in those bonds back to the to the atom on the right, um, we see that the pKa tracks with the electronegativity. So um, methane has a pKa of about 55. Uh, ammonia is 35. Water is 15.7 and HF is 3.2. Okay, and so this is the highest pKa, and so it is the least acidic. And HF is going to be the most acidic. And so the conclusion is that as you move across a row from left to right, um, the pKa decreases as electronegativity increases. Okay, and so <clears throat> again, you can see this if you um, think about the conjugate bases of these species for methane. So consider conjugate bases 
for methane, it's CH3 minus. For ammonia, it's NH2 minus. Let me put the electrons in here. For water, it's of course hydroxide. And for fluoride or for HF, it's fluoride. Okay. And if you just look at the atoms, this is the least electronegative. This is the most. And so the anion, the conjugate base, is most stable uh, for the most electronegative uh, element. Okay. Um, and again, it's important to know the limitations of these types of comparisons. And so, for example, um, one cannot compare, um, um, let me see here. So one, one, one would not want to compare um, something like this. Uh, with, um, for example, uh, I just want, don't want to get myself in trouble here. Uh, um, one would not want to make that comparison. So even though it does follow the electronegativity trend, the oxygen, of course, is more electronegative than nitrogen. Um, there's an important contributor in terms of the resonance uh, for the uh, acetic acid. And um, we're going to come to that in a second. So it's, it's very important when you're using these types of trends that you limit your thinking or your comparisons to, to acids that are similar. So in the cases that I've drawn, for example, the charge is localized on a single atom in each case. Okay. So Okay, so increasing electronegativity, increasing acidity. Um, the one that might be a little trickier is what happens when you go down a column. So, Okay, and so as you move down a column, uh, the acidity of acids uh, tends to increase. The pKa uh, goes down. So let's consider like the hydrogen halides. If we have HF, HCl, um, HBr, and HI, the pKa's of these are uh, as follows. We have fit, we have 3.2, minus 6, minus 8, minus 10. Okay. And so we we rationalize these observations using a different model. And what we talk about is what we call the polarization or the polarizability of the atomic orbitals. And if you think about the 
sizes of the conjugate bases. If I were to write these out qualitatively, fluoride would be something like this. Chloride would be big, bigger. Bromide would be even bigger. And iodide uh, would be the largest, okay? And so as you move down the column, the van der Waal radii, the size of the atoms are getting bigger. And when you then put a negative charge onto that atom, it is much more diffuse. It is spread out over a much larger area. So I should say a larger volume. Uh, as you go from left to right. And anytime that you can delocalize charge, this is a stabilizing thing. You know, nature doesn't want little pockets of charge. You want to spread it out as much as possible. So So with I minus, I have a negative charge um, and I can distribute that across a giant outer valence orbital. For fluoride, by comparison, I have a negative charge, but it's held, it's localized in a small region of space. And so this is, you know, rel maybe a relatively new idea and uh, it runs counter to the electronegativity argument because we would say that um, this is the iodide is the least electronegative and fluoride is the most. Okay, so this idea of diffusion of the of the negative charge runs counter to the electronegativity, um, and that is true. And so the, the charge dispersion or charge diffusion is actually more important than the electronegativity as you go uh, down the periodic table. When you're going from left to right, you're in the same shell. And so the, the changes, in, there are changes in the van der Waal radii, but they're much smaller increments. And so in that instance, electronegativity sort of carries the day. And so, you know, you, this will come up frequently. You'll, you'll sort of have contradictory kind of um, rationale that you have to balance against one another. Um, and so in this case, it's going to be this, this idea of, of charge dispersion. Okay. And so this allows us to think about relative acidity going left to right or top to bottom. Um, what about uh, substituent effects? And so And so the single most important contributor, so now we're just not gonna consider the nature of the atom bearing the negative charge, but we're gonna consider the structure of the molecule bearing the negative charge. 
The single most important factor is going to be resonance stabilization. Um, and again, we're going to fall back on this idea that anytime we can delocalize charge, it's going to be stabilizing. So previously we said, it, you know, delocalizing it around a single atom. Now we're going to think about um, situations where we can delocalize it within a molecule. So. Okay, and so a good example is going to be um, considering methanol versus, say, acetic acid. And for methanol, we can draw an equilibrium where we have methanol plus water is in equilibrium with methoxide plus hydronium ion. Okay, and the pK of methanol is about 15, okay? Um, and if you go to acetic acid, you can draw the same type of equilibrium. where you've got now acetate and hydronium ion on the right side of the equation, okay? And the pK of acetic acid is 4.76. Okay, so it's about 10 orders of magnitude more acidic than methanol. And how do we explain that? You can't look at electronegativity because the atoms are the same. The underlying effect is a resonance one. So in acetic acid, I can take the conjugate base acetate and start to push electrons um, around the molecule. So starting from the oxygen bearing the negative charge, push them up to carbon. And then of course, I'm gonna have to break a bond to carbon because I can't have 10 electrons. So I'll take the pi bond and move it up to the other oxygen. And so what I wind up with is, it's actually an identical resonance structure But what it tells me is that that negative charge is spread out among the two oxygens. And another way to sort of emphasize that would be to draw it sort of like this. Okay, so the negative charge in the acetate ion is, is, is spread out and in particular, it's spread out among two, over two very electronegative oxygen atoms. So, Okay, and we can make the comparison then to the conjugate base of, of methanol methoxide. And if I draw that, I'll draw that over here on the right. So it's on the same slide. Um, there's no resonance stabilization possible. 
another way I could put that is that the charge is localized on a single oxygen. So. Okay, and so again, can't delocalize the charge. Charge is centered in, you know, in one spot that is less stable uh, than a situation where I've got the charge spread out. Nature always wants to uh, diffuse charge, okay? And so the last, uh, or the second, uh, second and last uh, factor um, are what we call inductive effects. And Um, these are different than resonance in that they are, um, they can be longer range and sort of proceed through uh, sigma bonds in the molecule. So we haven't really explicitly discussed this, but when we draw resonance structures, we're typically moving pi bonds around uh, inductive effects. Um, uh, can also, well, they can occur through pi bonds, they do occur through pi bonds, but they occur more frequently through sigma bonds. So uh, we, can, we can call them polarization. Uh, polarization of a molecule through um, through sigma bonds. And so um, as an example, you can look at trifluoroacetic acid. And acetic acid. Okay. Um, pK of trifluoroacetic acid is about 0.23, pK of acetic acid is 4.76, right? And so trifluoroacetic acid, much more acidic. Look to the conjugate base and try to think about why that conjugate base might be more stable. And if I draw it out, Okay, those are the two conjugate bases. So in other words, you know, lose a proton minus H plus, minus H plus. I get to those species that I've drawn. Both of them have the resonance effects that we discussed, um, but the trifluoroacetate on the left benefits from the inductive um, electron withdrawing ability of the fluorines. And so if you consider the carbon fluorine bonds, the electrons in those bonds are not shared equally between carbon and fluorine. In fact, the fluorine is sucking the electron density away. So we draw these bond dipoles to show that, okay? Um, and what that means is that this carbon here uh, is electron deficient, okay? Uh, let me erase that. 
Okay. Uh, it has a partial positive charge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the way we can represent that partial positive charge is with delta plus. Okay. Um, and now you can see, hopefully, that I've got a negative charge on the right, partial positive charge on the left. Anytime you bring opposite charges together, that is stabilizing. So Okay, but I can't really find myself, uh, find a way to the same type of effect with, uh, with acetate. So carbon and hydrogen are very close in electronegativity. Okay, they have almost equal, equal electronegativity. The CH bonds are not polarized, at least not strongly. Okay, and so the conclusion then is that you don't have um, partial positive character at that adjacent carbon. So, and therefore there's no inductive stabilization. Okay, and so trifluoroacetic acid winds up being significantly more acidic than acetic acid because of this inductive effect uh, from the fluorine atoms. And this is an effect that can manifest over uh, many different, over, you know, sort of longer bonds, uh, longer distances. Um, so I give you another example. So this is 222 trifluoroethanol. And this is simply ethanol. Okay. And so the pK of uh, trifluoroethanol is about 11. And the pK of ethanol is about 17, 16 or 17. Okay. So it's about five or six units more acidic uh, than ethanol. And it's the same type of effect. So we don't have any resonance here, but we do have these strongly polarized CF bonds. Uh, where Um, that carbon atom uh, at the end uh, has a lot of partial positive character because the electron density is being sucked out of those sigma bonds uh, towards fluorine. And so that leads to stabilization of the uh, conjugate base. Mm -hmm. So the take home message is that um, when you're thinking about inductive effects, you're really thinking about electronegativity. Mm -hmm. 
So inductive effects derive from differences in electronegativity. And that's where it's important to remember that mnemonic that I gave you. So uh, fluorine, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine, sulfur, carbon, hydrogen, phosphorus, silicon. Um, and so you don't need to, you know, it's nice to know the numbers. If you can uh, commit those to memory, that's great. But just knowing the order is enough uh, to be able to uh, predict uh, the, you know, the presence or absence of inductive effects and the relative order can give you the relative sort of strength of those effects. So um, those are the two things you need to consider when you're looking at substituents uh, in the molecule as a whole. All right, so that wraps it up for uh, lecture six.